All right, uh, take your Bible this morning, turn to the book of 1 Thessalonians, chapter number 4. We're dealing with part 4 this morning on a message entitled, See You Here, There, or In the Air. And uh, let me direct your attention to verse number 16 and 17 again. For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for this time we can spend together looking at this passage. Lord, help us to realize that what we just read could take place today. And we pray that every person in this room is ready for the coming of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we pray if they're not ready that they'll, they'll trust you as their Savior today and get that settled. Bless our time together in the Word now. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Now, we have been looking at this passage. We looked at the uh, first part of verse number 16 last week. And we're going to pick up where we left off. We're gonna, we looked at the shout, and we're going to now look at the, the sound of the trumpet. He talks about, and with the trump of God, he says right here. You know, trumpets in the Bible, they were used for a variety of reasons. If the trumpeter's call was confusing then confusion would be created among those hearing the trumpet blast. Is the trumpeter calling us to war, or is he calling us to worship? There's a big difference in those calls. There were several calls of the trumpet in the nation of Israel. For example, they had a call to assemble for worship. When the Lord returns for us, we will assemble to worship uh, for sure, when he comes back. Uh, then there was a call to advance for a march or an attack. And for example, in the wilderness, in the Old Testament, when we read there, we find that the pillar of cr cloud, when it moved, it led the people. And as that cloud moved, then the trumpets were blown to notify the people to move and follow the Lord. Uh, we too are to be following the Lord Jesus Christ. If you know him as your savior, that's what you're supposed to be doing. One day, the trump of God is going to sound at the rapture of the church. And we will literally be on the move, amen. I used to watch a cartoon when I was a kid. It was, it was a cartoon that had Snagglepuss the cat. And he would, all the times he would say, exit stage left when he wanted to leave the room. Well, when Jesus comes back, it's exit stage up. Amen. Now, there's something else about the trumpet call. There was, there was a call of absolute joy and rejoicing. There were times of great joy and gladness on the various festival occasions that the Hebrews had. During these feasts, the people, they rejoiced together before the Lord. And you know what? When Jesus comes back, we are going to rejoice together. And we're going to rejoice with great joy when Jesus comes back for us. There was a fourth call, the call to alarm. Trumpets were sounded to warn of an attack or impending danger. And when the rapture of the church takes place, beloved, this entire planet will be thrown into impending danger like it has never seen before in human history. First of all, the Christians are going to be removed. There's going to be the removal of something else. There's going to be the removal of resistance toward evil. You think things are bad now. You think things are stupid now and crazy and idiotic now. In the tribulation, it's going to be a whole lot of work. There is no, there's not going to be any common sense in the tribulation at all. Man's wickedness will have no restraint at all. Now, what is very interesting about these details that we read about the rapture of the church is that the details are similar to the Galilean 
Jewish wedding. Their wedding customs were, were unique to their region. The wedding customs illustrate that the, the wedding will take place one day with the Lord Jesus Christ when he returns to claim his bride, the church. So let's take a look at the customs. Uh, once the wedding covenant or the contract was agreed upon between the groom and the bride, the betrothal ceremony, that's what they called it, the betrothal ceremony was concluded. And at that time, with the agreement of the contract, the, the couple was legally married. The bride and groom would then depart and prepare for the wedding, which took approximately one year. They would not go home. Even though they're legally married, they would not go home with one another. They would not consummate the marriage. They would go home and start getting ready for the wedding ceremony. All they've done now is had a contract. That's all they have exchanged. But they're going to have a wedding ceremony in about a year. That one, about one year period, they called that the betrothal period. And during that period, it was the groom's responsibility to prepare for the wedding feast and prepare for the arrival of his bride. He's preparing. The groom would prepare a place to live for himself and his bride. Now, in most cases, he would add a room to his father's house. That's usually what they did. This is where the couple would live. They would usually live in the father's house. Wood and brick for constructing the room, as well as furniture, were prepared. Now, you know, it's interesting. Jesus spoke about this custom when he spoke of his return in John chapter 14. He said in John 14, verse 2, get this. He says, in my father's house are many mansions. That word mansions there means dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. Then he says this. The Lord's talking. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. Christ is preparing a dwelling place for us right now in heaven. And the Bible says those dwelling places are in the house of God the Father. Just like the Galilean wedding. Now, during that betrothal period, the bride would prepare for the hour when the groom would come for her. She would use that time to prepare her wedding dress. She would take all those months, all that time, to prepare her wedding dress. She would shop. She would purchase material for her gown. She would keep herself pure for her husband. And in the same manner, the Christian is to prepare for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ by living a godly life. That's the way we're supposed to live as Christians, beloved. And not only that, by serving the Lord and watching and waiting for the arrival of the Lord Jesus Christ, just like the Jewish bride was looking out for the groom. You know, John spoke about the importance of our preparation in 1 John 3, verse 2 and 3. Now, here's what he says to you and me. He says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him and we shall see him as he is. Then he says this, and every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Just like the bride kept herself pure in that betrothal period, we as Christians, we're to keep our lives pure for the Lord Jesus Christ. We're to live godly lives. You know, the bride had to be ready for the arrival of her husband who would come for her at any time. He could show up at any time, just like a thief in the night. In fact, many times in that Galilean wedding, the groom would come in the dark hours of the night. 
Paul said this in 1 Thessalonians 5.2. He said this, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Now, as the time for the wedding feast neared from the passing of the months, the bride prepared herself. By sleeping, get this, she would sleep in her wedding gown. Those were her pajamas, amen. Her wedding attendants were also dressed, and they were also ready to go. See, that bride, she never knew the day or the hour when the groom would show up. But she knew the season when it was imminent. She knew when it was getting close. By the way, the groom did not know that information either about the time of the wedding. The groom didn't know. Galilean weddings were surprise weddings. See, the groom did not determine the time to go get his bride. The, the groom didn't determine that. We say, well, all right, preacher, who made the decision? I cannot tell you it's a secret. No, I'm just kidding. All right. No. Who determined it? It was the father that made that decision. The father determined when the wedding would take place. He was the one who told the son, go get your bride, son. Go get her. Now is the time. You know, it is very possible that God the Father may be the one that makes the decision for the time of Jesus' return. Now, why would I say that? Well, Mark 13, 32 says this. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Well, the Father is the one who gave his Son Jesus came on this earth and he did the Father's will. Could it be that the Father makes this decision here? It's very possible. I'm not dogmatic about it, but it's very possible. When the Father gave the order to go get the bride, the Son would sound the shofar. A shofar is a ram's horn, okay? And he would blow that trumpet, usually in the dead of the night, because that's when they went to go get the bride, they would blow that, blow that ram's horn to awaken the village to assemble the people for the wedding feast. The sound of that horn in the middle of the night would awaken the guest of the wedding. And of course, they would also awaken the bride. When she heard that ram's horn, she knew she better be ready to go. The groom or his friends would, as they would make their way to the bride's home, they would, they would shout out, Hey, y'all! The bridegroom's coming. Y'all get ready to go. Of course, you didn't know they all had southern accents, did you? you know? But that's what they did. The bridegroom's coming. He's coming. And the people who were awakened, they would go out and meet the bridegroom who marched to the home of his bride. Matthew 25, verse 6. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Now, isn't that interesting? Well, when the groom arrived at the home of the bride, she was ready and she was prepared in her wedding gown along with her bridal attendants. And of course, that brings us to the next detail of the Lord's arrival. We want to look at the snatch there. The Bible says, verse 16, when Jesus comes for us, that the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. When Jesus Christ comes back, the souls of the Christians who returned with Jesus will be reunited with their glorified bodies, and they will rise first, from their graves to meet the Lord in the clouds with their new bodies. That's what the Bible says. This will happen instantaneously. Understand that if Jesus tarries, this verse is talking about you and I who know Jesus Christ is our Savior. 
This is what is going to happen to anybody who knows Jesus Christ as their Savior and has already died and is with the Lord right now. The Bible says the dead in Christ get to rise first. The Christians that are alive and remain on this planet will be caught up together with the dead in Christ and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it says. They will all meet in the clouds. Now, you need to understand, this can happen today. There's nothing that says this could happen today. In fact, notice the words caught up there. They will be caught up, the Bible says, together. The words caught up are formed from an interesting Greek word, harpazo. That's the word. Greek scholar Dr. Kenneth Wiest explains the different meanings of this word, harpazo, the word for caught up. First of all, it means to catch away speedily. In fact, in Acts 8.39, the Spirit caught away Philip after he had led the Ethiopian to the Lord Jesus Christ. And when the Lord returns, Christians, the Bible say, will, says, will be caught away quickly. They'll be snatched within the blink of an eye, the Bible says. Number two, here's another meaning of the word harpazo, caught up. It means to seize by force or to pluck up. That's what it means. In fact, it's, in that same word is used in John 10, 28. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my, my hand. See, the Bible says we are eternally secure in Jesus Christ. Satan cannot snatch your soul from the hands of God. I don't know about you, but that's a great blessing. Now, there's another meaning of this word, harpazo. It means to claim for one's self. The, this views the rapture from our Lord's point of view as he comes to claim his bride. When Jesus comes back, he's coming to claim his bride. The bride is the church, those who have trusted Christ as their Savior. Number four, it means to rescue from danger. Jesus Christ will remove the Christians in this world before the dangers of the tribulation are unleashed upon this world. He's going to take us out before that seven-year period. Number five, that word harpazo means to move to a new place. Amen. Paul used this word when he described being caught up to heaven in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. When Jesus Christ returns for every single Christian, he will move us to a new place immediately. That was his promise to you and to me. It is why we can say to other believers when we depart, I will see you here there, <laughs> or in the air. Jesus promised us a new place in John 14. Verse 2 and 3 again says this, In my Father's house are many mentions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And then he says, and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now, the word receive is a very interesting word here. It's from the word paralambano, which means this. It means to take with one's self or to join to one's self. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 5, that exact same word is translated, taken up. Uh, the Bible says in Matthew 4, 5, Then the devil taketh him up. Talking about the Lord here, when they tempted him. Taketh him up unto the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple. See, at the rapture, we are going to be taken up by the Lord. Now, this brings us to a wonderful truth from the Galilean wedding customs. When that groom arrived at the house of the bride and he met her, the groomsmen sat down 
a litter in front of the bride. A litter is like a chair that has poles on both sides so that the chair can be carried. She would sit down on that chair, on that litter. Then the bride was lifted up into the air and she was carried to the father's house where the wedding feast would take place. Now here's what's really cool about this. The Galileans called this, uh, this taking the bride on the, the litter. They called it this. They called it flying the bride to the father's house. Amen. <laughs> flying the bride to the father's house. When the Lord takes his bride, we are going to fly to the, the Father's house. When he takes his bride, the church, to heaven, believers will then enjoy, the Bible says we will enjoy a wedding feast known as the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is a supper that is provided for all Christians. It's provided by the Lord. And you know, I was thinking about this this morning. I wonder what we're going to eat. I wonder what we're going to drink. Who, who's going to sit next to me? Who's going to sit across from me? I started thinking about that. Well, do you know, preacher? I don't have a clue, but I'm looking forward to finding out when I get there. Amen. Revelation 19, verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. This is what's going to happen. And his wife had made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. See, the only reason we get to go to heaven as Christians is because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And we've been forgiven and cleansed by his blood. That's what happens when you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior and put your faith in him. He forgives you. When you ask for forgiveness, he forgives you. He cleanses you. And he gives you eternal life. But you have to put your trust in him. When I was 15, I said, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And Lord, I need you to come into my heart and forgive me and cleanse me of my sin. Lord, forgive me for what I have done. And Lord, I'm trusting you to take me to heaven. And then I went one step farther. I said, Lord, I know you're speaking to my heart about being a preacher. And I surrender my life to you tonight to do that also. Lord, save me, and Lord, thank you for calling me to preach the gospel. My life took a 180-degree turn that night in August in 1971, and I have never been the same since. Uh, you know what? I'll tell you what, beloved, we have so much to look forward to. You know, the Bible says here, it says, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. If you know Christ as your Savior, you got a supper you're going to attend. You know, Adrian Rogers, a great preacher who's with the Lord now, he told the story about his boyhood. And he said that when he was a little boy, that near his house there used to be a scrap metal yard. There were all kinds of different metal in that scrap yard. And there was a great, giant, big magnet on a crane. It was an electromagnet that would move that steel and that iron from one place to another. If you were to take one of those giant magnets and sweep it across the, the ground, any metal above and even below the ground would rise to the power of that magnet. Zinc, lead, steel silver, aluminum would all rise. Iron, however, would rise first because iron has the same nature as the magnet. In the same manner, if you have the same nature, the same spirit as Jesus Christ, you are going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. It will be magnetic for sure. 
His promise to all believers is we will forever be with the Lord. Now that's a huge blessing. Uh, so let me ask, are you going on the ride of the flying bride to the Father's house? If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're ready for the ride. I see, because when you trust Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit lives within you. And you have that divine nature in you. Now, before we leave verse 17 in our wake, I want to note one word that holds tremendous truths concerning our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the word with. We talked about this about a year ago. The Bible says we will... Uh, be with the Lord in the clouds and we will be uh, forever we will be with the Lord when you go back to the Greek language there are three different words that are translated with uh, the first one is the word meta meta now that one means someone who is in the proximity of or the vicinity of uh, companionship fellowship association uh, let me show you how it's used in a sentence. For example, speaking of Jesus, they said, the crowd was with Jesus, okay? Uh, in that case, it means that they were in the vicinity where Jesus was located. Uh, it meant the crowd was nearby in proximity, okay? That's the word meta. Then there was a second word, para, P-A-R-A, -A, which means to be next to, to, to be near or beside. So this word means to be a little bit closer to somebody. Uh, when you look at this word, it implies that the people were, were close to Jesus physically. Uh, let me give you a sentence. They said of Jesus that he sits down and he eats with publicans and sinners. So that word... Para means that he was close in proximity around the table with the publicans, okay? Now, there's a third word that's used. That's the word soon, S-U-N. And when we look at 1 Thessalonians 4.14 4, and verse 17, the word uh, meta, which means proximity, or para, which means close to, those words are not used in those verses. The word soon is used. And that word has a much different meaning. It means to have companionship, closeness, union, completeness, or to have a close relationship. That's the word that's used here. It doesn't mean to be in proximity of. It doesn't mean to be sitting at a table nearby. It means that there is something deeper that occurs between the two entities. There is a close relationship. So applied to us, it doesn't mean if you're in the vicinity of God, you can be saved. Or if you sit down to eat with the Lord, you can be saved. doesn't mean that. It says the only way that you can get to heaven is by having a close relationship with the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only way you're going to go to heaven. There is no other way. You must put your faith in Him in order to enjoy His saving grace and mercy. Those who have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ will be caught up with the saints in the air and forever Christians will be with the Lord. Boy, what a blessing. And then verse 18, we see the concern for delighting and developing others. He says, wherefore comfort one another with these words. The truth about the rapture of the saints is a source of blessing to all Christians. It's what, it's what gives us hope. It's what we are looking forward to. God's promise to us assures us of what will take place in the future. We are in His hands. Paul taught us to comfort one another with these promises. This passage is especially comforting 
at funerals of Christians who have died and gone on to be with the Lord. To them who have gone on, we can say, well, so long for now. I will see you in the air on the other side. I've said that to many people lying in their caskets. Now, they can't hear me, but I wanted to say it anyway. I'll see you in the air. And I'm glad I could say that to my mother and my father and my grandparents and loved ones that have been in this church who have died and gone on to be with the Lord. I'm glad I could say it to them too. And we have so much to look forward to. Now, if you're not a Christian, this is not going to happen to you. You're going to be left behind. And when Christ comes, all those who know Christ are going to literally disappear. I mean, gone. And if it took place right now, all you would see is clothes left behind on the pews. And then the panic begins. Because you're going to realize you've been left behind. And when that happens, of course, just surviving that day will be a miracle. With all the cars crashing, all the planes crashing and the trains crashing, the chaos and pandemonium, well, why would they crash, preacher? Well, you're going down the highway at 70 miles an hour, and all of a sudden, if, the, if there's a Christian driving, all of a sudden, there's nobody driving the wheel. There's nobody at the steering wheel. Uh, so what's that car going to do? It's going to crash eventually. Same thing if there's a pilot on the airplane. Well, he's got a co-pilot. What if both of them are safe? Huh? There's going to be a lot of chaos and pandemonium and a lot of fires, people cooking on their stove, and all of a sudden the person's gone, the, f the food's still cooking on the stove. I mean, there's a lot of crazy things that are going to happen. But this world will be thrown into pandemonium. They're going to be wondering what in the world has happened. And you don't want to go through what's going to happen in that seven-year period. The book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, talks about all the scary things that are going to happen in that seven-year period. You don't want to be here for that. So if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, this would be a great day, Mother's Day, to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. And if you're a Christian and not ready to go, if maybe there's some things that are not right between you and the Lord, hey, go, get those things right today. And determine to be the best Christian you can be for Jesus. Let's pray.